Hello, all. Welcome to a new edition of uh, Euro Questions, our series of webinars where every fortnight we discuss European news and present the Jacques Delors Institute's research. Today, we are very pleased to greet Nicolas Koller Suzuki, Associate Re Researcher on the Digital and Trade Issues. He has kindly accepted today to discuss with us the notion of European digital sovereignty. Indeed, digita digitization poses many new challenges for Europeans and has led to calls for digital sovereignty, most recently in the French presidency of the European Council's work program. But what is digital sovereignty and who is it for? How does Europe plan to address these challenges with the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and the Data Governance Act? And what is the role of technological competition and cooperation with other countries, in particular, China and the United States. It is more precisely these issues that we will discuss today in order to understand more acutely the orientations that the EU's digital policy is taking. Before leaving the floor to our speaker, I like to remind you that the Q&A tool is available at the bottom of your screen. You can ask your questions there and I will forward it to Nicholas in the second part of this 30 minute webinar. Without further ado, I wish you a very good Euro questions and Nicholas, I leave the floor to you. Thanks for inviting me to this very timely edition of your questions, Mathieu. So just yesterday, the French government held a high profile conference on Europe's digital sovereignty. It's clear that the digital agenda is a priority for the French presidency. And of course, it is high time to set the course for Europe's digital future. Let me highlight three issues in particular. The first one is that human interactions and connected devices generate more and more digital data. So we need to figure out how to govern this data and to what end it is used. The second one is that decentralized communication on social media has created many useful interactions, but it has also led to an avalanche of misinformation and hate speech that are a danger to democracy. And the last one, is that the digital transformation of the economy has come with network effects. This means that the more people use a service, the more useful it becomes for all other users. But once a platform reaches a certain size, it becomes difficult for newcomers to challenge the established players. Now, the EU wants to address these issues, but there are so many proposals in the pipeline that it is sometimes easy to lose track if you're not in the Brussels bubble. What I therefore want to do in this webinar is to give you a quick overview of some key pieces of the EU's digital agenda and put them into a wider context. I will then try to answer the question we have in the title, are the EU's digital regulations helping Europe to achieve digital sovereignty? And maybe more fundamentally, who is this digital sovereignty actually for? Now, this is a lot to unpack, so let us get right into it. Let's start with the files and the Commission's strategy on data and AI that was first presented to the public in February 2020, so two years ago. Several ambitious pieces of legislation are now getting very close to the finish line. Um, and others will probably be concluded later this year or early next year, but we won't have time to discuss them all today. For example, there's the CHIPS Act for semiconductor production in Europe, the Artificial Intelligence Act for the ethical use of AI, the Cyber Resilience Act to reduce online vulnerabilities, and the Data Act to improve the conditions of sharing non-personal data. They are all important in their own right, but for the sake of time, we will focus today on the Data Governance Act, the Digital Services Act, and the Digital Markets Act, which could all be concluded very soon. Of these three, the Data Governance Act, or DGA, is closest to completion. It will create rules for data intermediaries with uh, which companies and public bodies can voluntarily share data that are subject to the right of others, like personal data, so um, others then can create value with this data. And it also creates a European Data Innovation Board that will develop guidelines for European data spaces with common standards that make sure they are interoperable. The Commission expects the European data economy to be worth 829 billion euro by 2025. So establishing trustworthy intermediaries that protect 
privacy and intellectual property will be important to harness this potential. The EU Parliament and Council already reached a political agreement on the DGA at the end of November, and it should be approved by the Council in the next couple of months. The Digital Services Act was first proposed by the European Commission in December 2020. Um, the European Parliament adopted a number of amendments at the end of January this year, and there are now negotiations with the Council and the Commission about the finalization of the package. At its core, the DSA is about the liability of online platforms, and it replaces the e-commerce directive from 2000 that has become a bit dated. The DSA will include obligations to remove illegal goods, services, and content, and requires transparency for algorithms that could spread disinformation. The obligations differ depending on the size of the platform, but small organizations would mostly be excluded. The most far-reaching changes would come for very large online platforms with more than 45 million users, which is roughly equal to 10% of the EU's population. Depending on the outcomes of the negotiations between the European institutions, there's also the possibility that targeted advertising could be restricted, which some online platforms are fiercely resisting. Uh, Facebook, for example, even threatened to leave the EU altogether if, it targeted, um, if targeted online ads would no longer be allowed. The last digital legislation I will mention here is the Digital Markets Act, or DMA. The DMA is intended to be the EU's instrument for tackling the problems of network effects in the digital economy that I mentioned earlier. It tries to address them by setting new competition rules for the largest platforms, that can be enforced with hefty fines of up to 10% of a company's annual global revenue. For example, the DMA requires large platforms to allow business users to accept payments outside of their platform, and it forbids platforms to give preferential treatment to their own goods and services. A lot of the political discussions on the DMA were about the definition of the large platforms, which the DMA calls gatekeepers. With few exceptions, there are firms from the United States, which has cast a shadow over transatlantic relations because many in Washington see protectionism and not competition as the key aim of the DMA. The current drafts target the so-called core platform services, which are defined as search engines, intermediation services, social networking, video sharing platforms, operating system, interpersonal communication services, cloud computing, and advertising. For a company to be a gatekeeper, a number of conditions have to be fulfilled, including a certain size and impact on the single market, the number of users, and whether it has an entrenched market position. So what's the state of play for the DMA? The commission came out with its proposal in December 2020. Um, the council came to a common position in November 2021 and the European Parliament in December 2021. The Council wants to change the criteria for the designation of gatekeepers. It wants to strengthen the right of end users to unsubscribe from platforms and have the European Commission as the sole enforcer of the regulation. The Parliament, on the other hand, would like to increase the quantitative thresholds for gatekeepers. It wants to expand the list of core platform services to also include voice assistants, web browsers, and connected TVs, and include provisions on default setting um, and strengthen how the DMA would deal with non-compliance. The trilogue negotiations between the European institutions started in January 2022. So with a strong push from the French presidency, we can expect them to also finish in the next weeks. Now that you have an overview of the EU's upcoming digital legislation, let's take a step back and look at why the French EU presidency is trying to frame this as digital sovereignty. What is digital sovereignty? Uh, the concept of sovereignty is, of course, not new. It goes back to at least the 16th century ideas of Jean Baudin, who argued that it is the absolute and perpetual power of a republic. So to put it in more modern terms, it is the state that has the authority to make final decisions in its territory. But states don't exist, exist in a vacuum. They interact with other states. 
So centuries of legal and political scholarships have tried to disentangle the effects of power hierarchies and interdependence in the international system. Still, the ideal of the sovereign state as the ultimate arbiter remains very important, in particular in France. So it is probably not a coincidence that France is also a driving force for the discourse of strategic sovereignty at the European level. But when we talk about digital sovereignty, we are not talking about the control of a state over physical territory. Digital sovereignty is about what happens in the digital domain. So how states can reassert their control over data, software, services, standards and protocols, hardware and infrastructure. Some of these might be outside of the state's territory and others are not even physical. So this makes it quite difficult for states to assert their full sovereignty in the digital domain. But it gets even more complicated. Bear with me. In uh, Europe, the term digital sovereignty is often also used to describe the individual rights of citizens. The emphasis here is on the autonomy that citizens have to make choices as the users of digital technology. The European Commission actually just proposed a declaration on European digital rights and principles at the end of January, um, which reflects this approach. It wants to, and I quote, place people and their rights at the center, support solidarity and inclusion, ensure the freedom of choice online, foster participation in the digital public space, increase safety, security and empowerment of individuals and promote the sustainability of the digital future. Sounds good. The problem is that digital sovereignty for states and for individuals may not always be the same. So let me just give you three quick examples. If digital sovereignty is interpreted to mean that you need to champion domestic companies to deliver services, you will not only have less choice for consumers, but these services will also become more expensive. If digital sovereignty is interpreted to mean that you have to localize the storage of data in your jurisdiction, it is very likely this kind of decentralization will actually weaken cybersecurity of personal data because there are economies of scale to hosting data safely. And last but not least, we should remember that in the long term, we face the challenge of digital authoritarianism, which could eventually also severely restrict the digital freedoms of internet users and democracies. And a shared approach amongst like-minded democracies is more likely to counter this threat than fragmented digital kingdoms. But let's not forget that there's also significant overlap between the state and the individual interpretation of digital sovereignty. If the internet is a wild west, as EU Commissioner Thierry Breton likes to say, the state taking back control can of course empower European internet users. But I think we can only reconcile the digital sovereignty of states and individuals if we are honest about creating a pro-competitive environment and being open to share standards with other like-minded countries around the world. Now, this is an important cleavage, both within the parliament and other EU institutions, because in spite of the rhetoric, some want to use technology regulation as a hidden form of protectionism to boost European champions against international competitors. This is not quite so hidden if you look at the statements by some MEPs, like the Rapporteur for the European Parliament's Internal Market Committee, Andreas Schwab, or the wishes of European CEOs like Tim Höttges of Deutsche Telekom, who would like to have the support of the EU to create European digital champions. But there's also the more neutral regulatory approach that is somewhat agnostic about the nationality of the regulated firms, and genuinely concerned about the negative effects of market concentration in the digital domain. In the end, we have to always remember that the digital agenda is not only domestic, but it is deeply linked to Europe's role in the world. And of course, technology plays an important role in the wider geopolitical shifts that we are currently seeing. Most importantly, it raises big questions about Europe's relationship with China and the United States. So, a non-protectionist approach is definitely crucial for the future of transatlantic relations, especially for those who seek a united digital front against China and other techno autocracies, for example, in the, um, in the forthcoming Internet Alliance. International cooperation in digital trade agreements and policy dialogues will be dead in the water 
if the DGA, DSA, and DMA would become blunt instruments of uh, European protectionism. But I think that if we want to be successful at integrating the state and individual dimension of digital sovereignty, the EU will need to carefully integrate its domestic digital agenda with international negotiations to avoid unnecessary barriers for digital exchange. So let me leave you with this thought for now and hand it back to Mathieu and your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. So I'll, I'll kick, kick off the Q&A. Um, I think the, the first question I'd like to ask is uh, maybe a, a precision. So you talked about rapidly about the Internet Alliance. What, what can you tell us about, about this? So um, the, um, the Biden administration, with much fanfare, started uh, a, a summit for democracy that was only virtual. Um, it was in November, I believe, of last year. And one of the key deliverables for the Summit of Democracies uh, was intended to be a, a united digital front of democracies. And this is what uh, the Internet Alliance um, is supposed to be. It didn't actually become a part of the, the summit that was held virtually, but um, it's supposed to be held at one point um, in the first meeting of the Internet Alliance, I think it's supposed to be held at one point this year, and then there's supposed to be concrete deliverables for the second summit of democracies later this year. Uh, thank you. I had another question um, about uh, so digital sovereignty. How do you relate it to the idea of technological sovereignty? Uh, do you think there's a big difference between the two, or do you think one feeds into the other? And uh, do you think, like a lot of people say, that uh, Europe um, uh, kind of missed the train on the uh, on the digital on the uh, digital pro products? Uh, do you mm -hmm. think that's the case and you think that that's something that can be corrected in the future? Well, I would not say uh, that these are fundamentally different. I mean, you, you maybe remember that I uh, mentioned um, the, the CHIPS Act, right? So this is more about technology rather than just purely, um, it's more about the infrastructure of, develop, of, of delivering uh, digital technologies rather than the digital um, domain itself. So I, I would say, of course, these are very closely interlinked and um, we need to have um, a good discussion about the integration of the two. That's, that's for sure. Um, you, can't, you can't have one without the other. Are uh, Europeans behind? I mean, if you talk about hardware um, for, for cellular manufacturing, the big firms are actually European, right? Um, if, um, if we think about chips manufacturing, yes, a uh, majority of the chips production right now happens in uh, Taiwan and uh, in the United States and Korea, but um, the, the back end, uh, the, the machines that make the chips, like those from ASML, which are very, 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 very complicated machines, um, they are actually produced within the European Union. So, um, you know, the, the question, I think, is not so much like, like whether we should bring all of this back to Europe. I think that's the point I was trying to make. Um, I would argue in favor of French shoring instead of reshoring. So if we think about these larger looming conflicts that we might have in the future with, um, with China um, and maybe other digital um, authority, uh, authoritarian regimes um, that might come up in the future, um, we need to have common standards amongst democracies and integrated supply chains um, amongst these countries that share a certain value base. And that extends both to the hardware and to the software. Uh, another question I'm, I'm getting from our audience uh, concerns. Um, so uh, big digital companies that are not based uh, immediately in Europe. So examples are Booking, TikTok or Snapchat. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are others. Uh, do you think that this new package of uh, European legislations can affect them? Well, if you're operating in the European market, um, it, it affects you, yes. So, um, of course, um, if, if you're not operating in the European market at all, then um, it, it might have some extraterritorial effects on, on hosting providers or so, which, which are also caught by um, regulations in the DSA, but uh, in general, I mean, most most big tech firms are operating in the European market, and for their operations in the European market, 
they um, they will have to follow these rules. And, and would you say that uh, in the same way as uh, other trade policy policy works, uh, do you think uh, in terms of uh, digital, the European market is strong enough uh, to 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 uh, have this uh, to impose these new legislations on these companies, or or uh, going back on on what face so what Facebook uh, threatened to leave the European market? Do you think that's something they can really afford? Um, I, I think this is an empty threat. I, I, I don't think um, this is they're actually going to follow through on it. I mean, it's the strength of the single market. If uh, if the 27 stand together um, and have a united front, the uh, the appeal of the single market, the biggest um, single market in the world, um, is is great. Be it in the digital sphere or in the physical sphere, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. So yes, in that sense, I mean, these standards um, uh, will certainly shine outwards, um, no matter what. And you already see that, I mean, um, Europe really was quite innovative here. There's, there's a, there's a uh, what I think is a rather ridiculous joke, you know, that um, the US has the, the GAFAM, uh, China has the, um, um, there's another acronym for the Chinese company, the B BATX, um, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, Xiaomi, and uh, Europe has the GDPR, right? But no, uh, no, no big players. But um, look, let's not forget. I mean, um, we need to have uh, regulations to create competitive markets. I think uh, that is quite clear. And and um, GDPR is just one piece of um, of a wider digital package. And it's not, you know, there, there were certainly also mistakes that were make, made there, but you're really, with, with the package that is coming up now, you're creating digital markets um, and a competitive environment for the future. And you're already seeing that um, the number of unicorns, so startups that are valued above 1 billion euros or 1 billion dollars, uh, depends on which, uh, which currency you use, um, you already have more coming out of the European Union than out of um, out of China, so um, you know there's a lot of pessimism, but I, I would say not all is lost. So <laughs> thank you, and uh, I think yeah, there is a bit of pessimism among our audience today, uh, but I won't hold that against them. Another question I'm getting is: Do you think the European Commission is acting a little late? uh compared to the the rapidity of uh of, of changes in the in the digital sphere no i mean europe really is at the forefront of global regulation here um that was the point i was trying to make i mean gdpr has been adopted in in somewhat equivalent forms all over the world you even see that um in the us you have had some adoption of privacy regulation in california and in the US, you have the saying, as California goes, so goes the rest of the country, because the California Californian market is so big. So this, that usually used to be um, the saying for regulations for, for cars and so on, uh, for, for goods, right? Um, but the same will sooner or later happen for privacy legislation in the US. And a lot of this is modeled on the provisions of the GDPR. So the EU was really like um, a policy laboratory in this sense. And the same you are seeing now for, for this package. Um, in, in, in the US, um, a, a lot of these ideas are being deliberated as well. And, um, and I think you are going to see that more and more countries are going to adopt similar ideas in the future. So no, the, uh, Europe is not late. Europe is actually in the lead here. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, more more legal questions. Uh, what are the treaty legal basis used for these legislations, and how does uh, how has competition policy been adjusted with industrial policy and in the idea of getting European champions in the digital sector? Is that something that's uh, always up to date, or do you think uh, in Europe uh, we've uh, we've um, we won't be able in the near future to get our own digital champions. I um, can't talk to the intricate legal details. My understanding is that there's actually not um, like in the treaties itself, a lot of um, uh, binding commitments on, on state aid, 
right? I think that is um, in secondary legislation. So um, to what extent this, uh, this is constrained by the treaties, I can't, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. So um, I think I'm the wrong person to, uh, to answer this question. Okay, thank you. Um, and maybe just one one last question. Uh, you mentioned it rapidly in your in your presentation about um, so cyber attacks and uh, security. Uh, what can you tell us about um, uh, what what Europe Europe is trying to do to reinforce cooperation and and fight against um, either fake news uh, or uh, or political uh, political uh, ingerence in uh, in European affairs. Well, for, for fake news, I mean, this is um, really the one of the core ideas of the Digital Services Act, right? As I, as I said, um, there are uh, very strong provisions in the DSA on how um, online platforms will have to tackle misinformation. And very large platforms actually have a number of, um, of obligations. I won't go through them all here for the, for the sake of time, since we only have a couple of minutes left, but I really encourage you to go um, on the website of the European Commission. They have a really handy chart on the obligations for the very large platforms. Um, and uh, they, they have a number of obligations how to deal with misinformation here. Um, so this is all, you know, I mean, uh, the political discussions for this are almost all over. Like uh, we are really in the, in the very final phase of it. Um, and it's going to come into force in the next couple of weeks or, or months. Um, so that's 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 what's going to be done about misinformation. Uh, maybe if I if I can just ask one one last uh, last question uh, yeah. because I think uh, we haven't talked about it too much. Um, in terms of uh, uh, investment plan, uh, so we talked about leg legislation. Um, is there a European in, in investment plan in the in the digital sector uh, beyond the, you talked about the Chips Act? Um, is is that is that something that's um, um, been treated in uh, in European funding? Um, well, I mean, they're, they're the, the 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 general um, uh, recovery funds. I think there's there's quite a, a bit of dedication to, um, to 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 digital, but I I don't know the specifics about this from the top of my head. But um, our, our colleague um, Eulalia from from JDI. Um, I, I recommend you have a look at her, her publications on the JDI website. Um, you will probably find all this information there with the detailed figures. Thank you very much. Thank you to have taken the time for, for the presentation and to, to answer uh, all these questions. Um, I thank the audience for following the webinar and I remind you that the replay will be sent to you shortly. Um, it will be uh, hosted on YouTube so you can uh, uh, have a look if you missed uh, the beginning of the webinar, for example. Um, and then I'd like also to announce that the next edition uh, will be held on February 23rd with um, our researcher Andres Isol, uh, who will give us an overview of the state of play of European recovery plans. Uh, this webinar will be held in French um, and more information to, to follow. Uh, thank you very much to, for being with us uh, this afternoon and uh, until next time. Thank, thanks a lot, Nicholas. Thank you so much.